In this lecture we're going to cover habitat use and social dispersion. And what I mean by this is at different times of the year birds use habitat differently. So during the nesting season they're restricted to a smaller area of habitat because in most cases both male and female are taking care of the young. They're growing rapidly. Now that's not always the case especially when we talk about precocial development. But during the non-breeding season we see that some species will maintain winter territories, non-breeding territories, but in other cases they will range more widely and have uh, larger home ranges that they may or may not defend to some degree. So just to kind of demonstrate even within closely related species how that can vary, um, on the left we have bank swallows which are colonial. They don't defend any territory except their nest itself, their nest cavity and they oftentimes will forage together and actually even potentially share information or learn from each other on the location of foraging resources. Now in contrast, something on the right, like a uh, northern rough-wing swallow, they're going to be solitary and not uh, closely spaced. And that latter category is what we see in most birds. Most birds during the breeding season and even in some cases in the non-breeding season on the wintering grounds will defend territories. This is an area that they defend the resources in that habitat exclusively for that one bird or the breeding pair and its young. Kind of depends again on whether we're talking about a breeding season territory or a wintering territory. Now this territoriality involves vocalizations which we talked about in uh, helping to establish where those boundaries are um, as far as a display and also some visual displays are usually associated with that. We've been seeing already birds that are normally relatively shy like brown thrashers uh, perched up much higher and uh, male singing and uh, indicating both a uh, vocal and a visual display. And then oftentimes especially in the early breeding season there is uh, active chasing off of potential rivals that are trying to invade the territory. And this is uh, many times just uh, associated with male competition, but in some cases uh, you can also see that the females will be involved in the territorial defense as well. So territories are a limiting resource and they oftentimes vary in the quality of those resources within the territory. And so the highest quality territories are going to be the most sought after and occupied first as a breeding season approaches. So this would be true of both resident and migratory species, but it's kind of easier to understand how these would fill if we talk about a, a migrant species. And so this figure right here kind of shows you how that would work. So we have uh, a number of, of habitats on the x-axis, and there, this is cumulative number of habitats. Some of these are the primary high quality territories, and some are secondary habitats that would be okay as territories, but the, the resource value is not quite as good as the primary habitats. So as the number of individuals arriving from migration increases, we see a, an increase in occupancy of those territories until it gets to the point where all of the primary habitat is just full. There aren't any more territories of that quality left, and so you're not going to have an increased number of territories uh, of that type anymore because they're just full. At that point, you drop down on the line and all of the subsequent uh, territories that are going to be occupied are going to be occupied by an additional number of individuals that are going to occupy these secondary habitats. Again, they may be good enough to, to nest, um, but the success associated with that may be reduced because there may not be enough resources, there may be less cover, there may be greater predation, so there, there's something about them that are not quite as good, but they're at least worth uh, attempting a nesting attempt. Any individual subsequent to that that arrives looks around and all of the habitats are full. There's basically no room at the end at that point. And at that point, we establish what are called floaters. All subsequent individuals are what we call floaters. So what a floater is, a floater is an individual that is not going to be territorial. It's basically living in marginal habitats, kind of on the edges of where the breeding territories are or sometimes sneaking in among the territories trying to utilize resources without being discovered. And in many cases these floaters are solitary and so they're basically trying to hide. In other species however the floaters form flocks. 
And when they do form flocks, we see the typical situation we see in social groups where you establish a dominant hierarchy so that there is uh, uh, dominant floaters that kind of uh, direct the movement of the flock and they may be the first individuals to take over a territory if an opening occurs because of maybe a death of one of the breeders. And in some cases, floaters can make up a substantial part of the population. In one study of uh, Rufus collared sparrows, they're, they may, made up about 50% of the population. And so what you oftentimes see in the breeding season, if you're studying a banded population, is if a uh, territorial owner dies, that spot is quickly taken over by one of these floaters. So we talked about the importance of arriving early and trying to get the best territory. There are other reasons why it's important to, to get that territory and establish it as your own because you oftentimes will develop what is called residence advantage. And resident advantage refers to the fact that if you are challenged for that resource, you tend to win in those battles. And there are a lot of questions like, why does residency advantage um, exist? Well, you can think about it as kind of like home court or home field advantage in a sporting event. Um, you're just more comfortable with the, the resources there. You know what the quality of the resources are, so you might fight harder. Um, and part of the reason you might have an advantage there is because you were the first to arrive anyway and you're just a higher quality individual and that's, that's how you have first established that, that territory. We spoke earlier about how, uh, when we talk about vocalizations, that there's a lot of singing and some aggression fighting over territorial boundaries early in the breeding season when you're establishing those territories, or the same thing on the wintering ground when you're establishing those territories. But then the singing rate uh, will still, they'll still sing, but the, the rate may go down a little bit. And what they're doing is, uh, again, listening to their territorial neighbors. And as long as you're singing from your spot and their neighbors are singing from their spots, the spots that you've already agreed upon with uh, a previous aggression, there's no need to fight over that again. And so at that point, you see what is sometimes referred to as the deer enemy hypothesis how these competitors at neighboring territories will actually work together if some floater or some individual from outside that doesn't know the rules comes in and tries to uh, take over one of the territories. So you don't want to take over your territory, but you don't want to take over the neighbor's territory either because if, if that happens, then you have to kind of start from scratch and, and start fighting this new individual and teaching them where the territory boundaries are. Now, sometimes territories can include larger social groups than just the breeding pair and their offspring. We're going to talk a little bit later when we talk about parental care behavior, a type of behavior called cooperative breeding. And one species in Texas that does this is the acorn woodpecker. They establish these territories which the quality really is defined by the number and quality of what are called granary trees um, and kind of the, the oak general habitat quality. These granary trees are dead trees or snags that the individual woodpeckers or the individuals in the group of the woodpeckers will fill individual holes with these acorns. Uh, and they'll use these when times are lean and, and acorn availability is low. They have then a, a cache resource of uh, available acorns. Now, so that makes these territories that have a lot of granary trees and high quality territory really valuable. And so you see the establishment of these larger social units, which are typically occupied by uh, the breeding pair and their offspring from previous uh, breeding seasons. And what these individuals, which we'll see are called helpers, are doing is they help feed their younger brothers and sisters. And one of the reasons they're doing that, we'll see, is because, again, they're helping to increase the reproductive success of their parents and, and you know, the, the greater the number of young that they help produce that are brothers and sisters, that's indirectly helping their fitness as well. Remember, fitness is all about passing on as many copies of your genes as possible. You can either do that directly by producing your own offspring or by helping raise extra brothers and sisters or, or other close relatives. Another reason for this that you would want to do with regard to thinking about territoriality in the future is, say, if you're an older male helper and dad dies, well, you're right in the position then to take over that territory. Now, the thing about territorial defense is it does take time and energy, and so it has to be worth it. The resources have to be worth d defending. 
So let's think about situations where that may not be the case. If we're talking about a resource that can change quickly, that's probably not going to be worth defending. So if you're in an insectivore and you're, you're kind of relying on finding these swarms of insects, those swarms of insects will move day to day. And so uh, you, you can't defend a set territory boundary. It doesn't make sense to do that. And so instead, what we see is what's called scramble or exploitation competition. This means you're simply just using those resources as quickly as you can, uh, and you're not even worrying about defense. Usually this is associated with um, resources that are really abundant too. And so there's, there's more of it to uh, eat than you can eat yourself anyway. So why worry about defending that? So think about like an insect swarm, for example, or uh, schools of fish. Now in some species, territorial behavior can be flexible and it's based upon some assessment of the cost-benefit ratio of that uh, behavior. So let's l give an example of that with golden wing uh, sunbirds in Africa. This is a nectivorous bird similar in behavior to hummingbirds in the New World. So here's an experimental study where they varied the quality of flowers in a territory. And when flowers are energy rich, it actually paid to defend them. And so you saw territoriality. And this is despite the fact that territorial defense costs a lot of energy for these nectivorous birds. But if flower patches are pretty poor, then you see that they just uh, opt for scramble competition because they really don't have the time or energy to defend these resources. And the resources really aren't very worthwhile anyway. So let's kind of look at this, this figure to, to demonstrate that. So the flowers that were not defended, these are po relatively poor resource that had about one microliter of nectar per flower. That's in contrast to the defended flowers, the high value flowers, which have double the nectar reserves. So let's look at the behavior of individuals in each of these situations. So individuals um, would spend eight hours foraging at a rate of about four kilojoules per hour for a total energy output in that eight hours of 32 kilojoules, okay? They didn't really spend any significant time sitting and no defense, as I mentioned, and that's, that's the total energy cost. Well, let's contrast that with the defended flowers. If you have these high rich flowers, you only need to spend about four hours, half of that time of these individuals in feeding, same energy rate, but you're only getting 16, uh, you're only expending half the uh, energy as well. Well, what do you do with the other amount of time? Well, a lot of it you can just sit. You don't have to do anything. And that saves you energy. Just uh, sitting and preening takes about 1.7 kilojoules per hour. And so you have substantially reduced your, your energy budget at that point. Well, you also end up having to do defense, though, because other birds are going to try to take over these high-value flowers. And you don't have to spend a lot of time doing that, so about 0.3 hours, so less than 30 minutes. Um, but look at the energy rate of that. That's a highly costly uh, behavior to do. But since you're not doing it very much, it doesn't really cost you that much. So overall, it is definitely more beneficial to have these high value patches, even though you have to do some territorial defense. But see, that you just don't have that energy capability here. It's not worth doing that um, with the, the low value flowers. Well, what about super abundant resources? Why should you defend those? Well, a super abundant resource really isn't worth defending. Again, because you would just spend all of your time running off competitors. It would be so attractive to competitors and you would just waste your time doing that. And anyway, if it's super abundant, that means there are far more resources there than you could consume anyway. So example of this is oftentimes seen when you see groups of shorebirds foraging on a beach. Now this isn't always the case. Sometimes they will defend real, uh, uh, small little patches of the uh, shoreline. But in some cases uh, you see them just foraging in groups. Again using a scramble competition or exploitation competition and not really worrying about territorial defense. And there are other reasons why you'd want to not be territorial. There are some advantages to foraging in groups that we've talked about previously. Remember, when you're in a group and your, your potential attack uh, by a predator is fairly great, um, you have better predator detection capabilities when you're foraging in a group. We demonstrated that with some of the examples previously, like when I talked about starlings. 
And also remember you can benefit from the dilution effect. If a predator does successfully kill someone in your group, the bigger your group, the, the less the probability that you are the individual that's killed. So when you do defend a territory, there is a, a correlate with uh, energy needs and the size of the territory. In general, larger birds need larger territories. And so you see that in this graph here, so that as mass increases, the territory size increases. But the relationship of how fast that increase uh, goes with increased mass depends on the foraging resource. Herbivores generally don't increase as fast. So as they get larger, they don't need as big a territory as a predator does. And that totally makes sense. I mean, if you think about the availability of resources in territories of the same size, if you're an herbivore, you're at a lower part of the food web and there's more general energy available, more resources available in a smaller uh, area than uh, predators, which are at a, a higher trophic level. And there's, so there's less uh, general air energy available in that community um, at that trophic level. So there's gonna be some variation. How do you determine for a species what the optimal territory size is? So it's kind of a, like a Goldilocks situation. You don't want to offend a territory that's too small. It doesn't have enough resources. That's not going to be worth it. But again, you don't want to spend a, a huge amount of energy defending a, a massive territory because, again, there's going to be more resources there than you uh, actually need. And you're going to have to cover so much ground and, and spend so much time in that defense that, again, the cost-benefit ratio uh, isn't going to work out for you. So here's a graphical approach to trying to figure out what is that sweet spot? What is the, the best territory size? And so if we see on the x-axis we have territory size and then uh, the associated cost or benefit line associated with that, this is just kind of a theoretical model. These curves, the benefit line and the, and the cost curve could vary, but in this example we have a nice linear, linear increase in cost with uh, increased territory size. So a big territory takes more cost, small territory doesn't take a lot of cost to defend. The benefits though has this kind of curvilinear relationship in this example such that um, with an increase in territory size early on you have a rapid increase in the benefits. But then again it gets to the point where well I can't eat any more than, than there is so even if I get a bigger territory I'm not really getting any benefits so that's going to level off. And what you want to look for is the area, the, so, the uh, size of the territory on the x-axis that is indicated by the greatest difference between the cost line and the benefit line. That is um, minimizing the cost, maximizing the benefits. And year to year this can vary. So the resources year to year, in a good year, um, these curves are going to change because the, the no amount of resources in the same size territory could increase or decrease. Uh, it's going to increase in a good year. But also population density is going to impact this. So in a denser population, we generally see smaller territories because there's greater competition for those territories and trying to pack individuals into those territories. And so that's something that could change year to year. And we'll talk a little bit more about this when we talk about population ecology in a later lecture. All right, let's move on to talking about colonial nesting species. Um, there are some big benefits associated with nesting colonially. We've already talked about uh, the information center hypothesis of how you can use information from individuals in your group to find food that's widely scattered and unpredictable in space and time. So if uh, all these gannets wake up in the morning, they fly out to sea looking for a meal for themselves and their young, they fly out in different directions and some individuals come back empty uh, build and others come back with their bill full of fish. Well, the individuals that didn't find food say, oh, that individual found food. I'm going to follow it back out to find that school of fish and uh, that way that information is shared. So the colony is the center of the information. And the next day the roles may reverse so that an individual is a loser one day may be the one that finds the individual and serves as the leader to the other individuals in the colony. So in the long term it can benefit multiple individuals in uh, the colony so it's a cooperative venture. Some other benefits include the potential mobbing of nest predators so you definitely could have a predator attracted to a large colony like this because there are a lot of eggs and young that could uh, be a temptation to a predator. 
but you see that the uh, individuals will defend their neighbor's nest at the same time they're defending their nest because they're just trying to keep those predators away from that breeding colony entirely. Now there are some other potential benefits of being a colonial nester and this can include extra pair copulation. So if you're a dominant individual and you've got a mate, uh, 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 let's say that you're a male and you've got a high quality uh, female that's uh, mating, you can help her out but at the same time you can uh, achieve some extra pair copulation with other females in the colony and, and gain a little extra paternity. Um, from the female perspective they could gain in this as well. They may be mated to a lower quality male but at least they have a mate um, but they may want to increase the diversity or the quality of the genes associated with their young and so they may uh, have uh, extra pair matings with the more high quality males in the, the territory. Females can also benefit from uh, intraspecific brood parasitism. We're going to cover this more in uh, detail in a later lecture, but brood parasitism is where a female will lay eggs into the nest of another individual. And in this case, so a female may not have a nest, or her nest may fail, but she may be able to sneak a few eggs into other individual nests in the colony, or even raise her own, but uh, if she can produce a few extra eggs, she again may try to uh, parasitize another uh, female and have that female uh, raise their young. Well, what are some of the costs associated with colonial nesting? Well, as I mentioned, you know, those colonies are going to be a big attraction to predators. And so you may attract more predators to the area of your nest than you would if you were kind of territorial and kind of hiding the, the location or your nest. Again, that's going to be kind of a cost benefit ratio in some cases the benefit of mobbing is going to outweigh that cost. In other cases, it may not. We just talked about how extra pair copulation and brood parasitism were a benefit. Well, sure, that's a benefit if you're a high quality male or a high quality female that can uh, sneak an egg into uh, a nest, but there are going to be losers in that situation too. Remember, it's a zero sum game. So if, if uh, your female or uh, is being mated by another male in the population, you may lose paternity associated with that. Or if a female sneaks an egg into your nest, uh, it may uh, come at a cost to some of your own nest nesting uh, young. And then finally, um, just as COVID has demonstrated, uh, large gatherings are not good for the spread of disease and parasites. And the same thing happens in colonial species. So you see in larger colonies, you can see the spread of disease and parasite. This was uh, very efficiently demonstrated by Charles Brown in a study of cliff swallows, in which sometimes the individuals would return to the same colony year after year uh, and nest, but eventually they would completely abandon a previous nesting site and move to another area. And it turns out one of the main predictors of that was the parasite loads associated with these old nests that had been used previously. Once they developed a fairly high parasite load, they would just start fresh somewhere else. And so Dr. Brown, he um, uh, did a study where he randomly selected some nest in a colony that had been occupied by a few years and was starting to get to that uh, parasite uh, buildup. And he fumigated some of the nest and looked at the growth rate of the young in the fumigated versus those that were untouched. And what he found was shown here on the right, in, the, in B. These two nestlings are the exact same age. The one on the right came from a fumigated nest in which the parasites were removed. And uh, the one on the left is the same age individual that, that was suffering from uh, dealing with some parasites. So we talk about in a colonial species that they don't defend territories, but they will defend their own individual spacing. And so you see this kind of defense of your personal space even in these highly social species. This just helps to reduce the aggression among individuals um, and reduce infighting. And so this is a great example of this. You see this nice spacing of individuals on this line. Sandpipers on the beach and maybe foraging together. But again, if anybody gets too close to your space, uh, then you're going to uh, attack them. And oftentimes the distance between individuals is that which is just out of reach from an individual being able to kind of lean over and peck you. But even in these social species, uh, they will sometimes even drop this degree of, of spacing. If it's really cold, uh, they will huddle together at night. 
This is seen in Inca doves and, and other dove species where they'll actually form these little pyramids uh, together to stay warm or brown creepers. These are cavity nesters that'll pack themselves densely into a cavity at night to try to stay warm. So I mentioned in a social group you want to try to reduce the amount of uh, fighting between individuals. And dominance hierarchies help to, to reduce that infighting. What a do dominance hierarchy is, is a period of checking each other out and looking at your, your quality. And dominant individuals are those that are able to uh, win in some competitions, so there is a little bit of fighting to establish this dominance. But you want to establish yourself as the dominant individual because you tend to get the best or the safest places to find food or to nest. So like if you're a colonial situation, probably nesting on the edge of the colony has higher predation rates than the interior. So the dominant individual will get the best spot. Same thing for foraging in a group. If it's safer to forage kind of in the middle of the group, the dominant individuals will be there. And then also we talked about some of the other advantages like extra pair copulation. If you're the dominant individual, you're going to benefit from those. So in this situation, why do subordinates play the game? Why don't they say, well, if I'm not getting it as good as that individual there, I'm just going to leave and, and breed on my own or abandon this group? Well, that's usually not the best. If, if it is a social species, what we tend to find out is, yes, they may not do as well as the dominance, but they still do better living in the group than they would if they were living alone. So they would have even higher predation rates if they were alone uh, of their nest or of themselves, or they may not be able to find enough food um, in a, a solitary situation. Now, the typical pattern in these dominance hierarchies uh, are that the big individuals dominate the small. Males tend to be more dominant than females and older individuals tend to dominate younger individuals. Those are some generalities. Uh, for, so for example, uh, the, in one species of social hawk, the Harris uh, hawk, um, where you see the opposite, that the females are the bigger individuals and they dominate uh, the smaller males. So once you've established these dominance hierarchies, communication is really key in to, first just establishing that. So there are some visual signals and some vocal signals that can kind of indicate what an individual is. Sometimes there can be patterns associated with uh, plumages, uh, darker uh, coloration in, in throat patches oftentimes is a, a signal of dominance. And then once those dominance hierarchies are set up, it's important to maintain them without a lot of aggression. So if you can just communicate, yeah, I'm the dominant individual, I'm the subordinate individual, you don't have to fight over it anymore. So some of these physical displays uh, include what are called appeasement displays or, or displays of submission. So this chickadee here is demonstrating this. Generally you'd want to try to make yourself look small. Um, keep your head down, your bill pointed down. Avoid making eye contact with the more dominant individuals. The dominant individuals on the other hand are going to do the opposite. They're going to make themselves look really big. They're going to point their head up and their, their bill pointed up and kind of uh, show how the bill could be used as a potential weapon if the subordinate doesn't uh, show some submission. Vocalizations can be important here as well. Um, so the dominant individuals will produce these uh, harsh vocalizations oftentimes. And oftentimes the submissive individuals will make a, a whining-like call that's very similar to the vocalization that nestlings make. In birds with crests, the elevation of the crest sometimes is an indication of their level of aggression. So in Stellar's Jays, uh, if you're a submissive individual, you want to lay that flat. If you're a dominant individual, you're going to see it really poked up high to indicate uh, a level of dominance and potential aggression against a submissive individual. So I mentioned some of the times the plumage badges can be indicators of dominance. Oftentimes they're tied to testosterone levels in males. So in house sparrows and, and hair sparrows, the darker this bib on the, the breast is, the more dominant they are. And these tend to be good, honest signals of individual quality. And this has been demonstrated experimentally by dyeing these individuals that are truly of a lower status to make them look like they are more dominant individuals. And at least initially, uh, that does... It's a pileated woodpecker. 
um, that does increase their dominant status, but eventually the, there are other signals that they have that kind of indicate that they need to be challenged by individuals, and so they are challenged and they, they end up losing uh, that dominant. And you don't want to show that you're dominant if you're really not. If, if you can't back that up, you're going to get challenged to physical uh, battles more often, and that's not going to be good for you. Now another key to establishing a dominance hierarchy that's stable is you got to remember who is the dominant and subordinate individual um, so that you're not constantly challenging each other. And um, so oftentimes we probably think that birds can see individual differences better than we can. Um, so they, they all may look the same to us, but they can probably see some subtle differences among each other. Sometimes there are differences in their vocalizations. We talked a little bit about this with regard to a nestling a begging vocalizations and social species of swallows. And in some species, the plumage patterns are variable enough that even we can tell the difference. So th these four birds right here are all four ruddy turnstones, but you can see that they vary quite a bit in these facial and chest and back neck markings. Okay, in the next video, we're gonna actually start talking about nesting and reproductive biology in birds.